Stay hydrated, eat lighter meals, don't go outside between 11am and 6pm. That's what Italy's health ministry is telling locals and tourists, as the Mediterranean is gripped by a blistering heatwave. From Israel, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was briefly hospitalised due to dehydration, to Spain, where they're undergoing the third severe heatwave this year. The region is waking up to a new and unpredictable reality. Climate change is here, and we are not prepared for it. Welcome to the iPodcast, where this week we're looking at what this extreme weather tells us about the future of life on the European continent, and if there's anything that we can do about it. First, we're joined by our foreign reporter, Claire Gilbody Dickerson, who's on the Italian island of Sardinia, one of the places worst affected by this heatwave. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us where you are, firstly, and what it's like at the moment. Yes, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. I'm in Sardinia, in Alghero. I am sitting at a cafe under a gazebo, and there's just a few locals who are sitting around, having a coffee, chilling, yeah, trying to get some shade, really, because as soon as you walk off this gazebo, it's like the desert. It's never been so hot. I mean, I've been coming here for the past 28 years and even I find it insufferable. It's just too hot to do anything. How long has it been like that, Claire? It's been like this for the past week or so. According to the Italian national forecaster, these temperatures are are going to carry on until the end of this week as well, at least. It's caused by an anticyclone that's coming from Africa. They call it Caronte, which is a reference to, um, there's basically this character in Greek mythology that carries bodies to the underworld. And it's just an inferno. And what kind of temperatures are we talking about? Yeah, right now it's 39 where I am, um, and obviously it's only 11 o'clock in the morning, but we expect temperatures to go up to 41, 42 tomorrow, and according to meteorologists here, we might break the record that Sicily recorded two years ago, 48.8, we might be smashing that record. 48.8? Yeah, we might be exceeding that in Sardinia. Sardinia has become the epicentre of this heat wave in, uh, in Italy and Europe in general. And it's a similar picture across the Med, isn't it? I mean, there's that sort of huge region which is experiencing these really unprecedented temperatures. Yeah, well, you saw Greece closing down the um, Acropolis during the hottest hours on Friday to avoid any tourists from, like, collapsing because the the heat is having a lot of um, repercussions on people's health, especially, especially, you know, elderly people or children or tourists who are not used to the weather. Sardinia has always had really hot weather conditions, but it's never been so much for so long. I think that's what climate scientists are most most worried about. And how are people coping with it? I mean, are people still able to work? Are people still <laughs> going out? Yeah, I think it depends entirely on what you do. Like, obviously, if you're in the office, then it's easier because you have air conditioning. But, you know, I've, I've spoken to a few mums and they say that ideally they would just stay at home with the AC, but they can't do that because obviously it's costing so much money nowadays. Wow. Mm. So they would go to the beach, but then she has a baby and there's only so much the the baby can be out in in, in the sun. It's not like there's much refuge, really. I think you just have to cope. What doctors recommend is that you drink loads and you make sure you have your sun cream on all the time, stay in during the hottest hours. And and yeah, those are the main things, the the main recommendations, really. Claire, tell us about some of the people that you've been speaking to. You've spoken to a couple of people really struggling with this heat. Yeah, while I was here, I spoke to Rosina Lynch. She is originally from Belfast, but she's been living in Sardinia for years. She said that she's been really struggling this summer because it's never been so hot. She's usually a very active person and it's just been really limiting. So we're not just talking about elderly people who are struggling here. It's also affecting younger people. Rosina manages an English school club and they have eight to 90 kids. She's been really contemplating the closure of the school for this week because they don't know whether they'll be able to safeguard the health and safety of the children in this heat. And they just can't take that responsibility on them. So if it becomes too much, then yes, it will take a toll on their business as well. We can hear a little bit from Rosina now. Well, hello. As a 
Irish person living in a very hot country. I have actually lived in Italy for seven years and now eight years, so altogether 15. Um, so I am a, a some way acclimatised. But I must say this summer, especially last week, we had extortionate heat. I'm not sure of the actual temperature. And I'm a quite active, very active person. Nothing stops me doing much. But for these couple of days, it was so hot that you basically had no energy. Didn't even want to go to the beach because it was too hot even to contemplate having the sun on you. As Irish skin, you feel like your skin is prickling. I think it's definitely hotter this year than any other year that we have had. And for a longer period of time, we've had a longer African wind, if you like. But in general, yes, coping, because that's what you do, you cope. I also spoke to Ella Harrison, who's a consultant for a charity in London. She's 30 and she was in Rome over the past weekend. She was there for a wedding. And the way she described it was, I'm in Rome and I'm dying. Here's what she has to say. Hello. So, in Rome for a few days. I got here on Wednesday. It's been, as you've known, crazily hot. Usually if I'm on holiday, I like to make the most of it and I'll be out the whole day. Here I'm just super conscious of it and just like really tired and needing a break in the middle of the day. I would come out to Italy this time of year, but I'd be by the coast. I wouldn't go for a city, but I think it'd just be a little bit more enjoyable when we're not complaining about the heat all the time, as a Brit would do. So yeah, I think I'll still come back. Yeah, I definitely would come back, but I'll just be by a breezy coast, you know, drink some delicious crispy white wine. I spoke to Eliana Salaris, a volunteer paramedic in Alghero. Buongiorno a tutti, mi chiamo Eliana Salaris e svolgo il servizio di emergenza sull'ambulanza. Negli ultimi anni il clima And she told me how over the past few years the climate has changed significantly. There are a lot more heat waves, the temperatures are a lot higher and the levels of humidity have also gone up. And this has all contributed to a spike in emergency calls. And the main reasons for them are heat strokes, congestions. But she also spoke of how bad air conditioning has been for some of the patients she's taken care of. Because obviously the body's going from being exposed to really low temperatures indoors to facing extreme high temperatures outdoors. And that obviously causes a shock to the system. She says that a lot of us are at risk of being affected and suffering from uh, the heat wave. But some categories who are particularly at risk, such as the, the elderly and children, tourists who are not used to the heat. And she also spoke of how much more intense her job has become over the, over the past few years because of extreme weather events uh, being more recurrent and lasting longer. During COVID, for example, it was particularly hard because they had to wear personal protective equipment while carrying out rescues. And she said that was a real struggle. And when it comes to rescuing people from the beach or from the middle of the street, the scorching weather just doesn't help. Claire, I'm interested in the kind of wider political repercussions of this. I mean, as you've outlined, it's having a real impact on people's day to day. But is that making them sort of think more seriously about the climate crisis? Are, are political leaders talking about this? What's the impact in that sense? Yes, absolutely. I think people are much more aware nowadays of global warming and the impact it's having on our climate and the way it's affecting people on an individual level. Italy still has a lot of work that needs doing in terms of cutting carbon emissions and just raising that awareness of things, you know. There's still a lot of work to be done in that area, but I think that these temperatures will undoubtedly send out that alarm to the politicians. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, as you may well know, she is a right-wing leader. She has had quite a nuanced position on climate change. She says that she does believe in what scientists say about global warming and how it's affecting the world's temperatures, but she has branded the EU's approach to climate change as climate fundamentalism. So there's kind of a sense that she is wanting to roll back some of the policies that the EU has adopted. But at the same time, she, she claims that ecology is an integral part of the right-wing agenda. So it remains to be seen with whether these the scorching temperatures and this, this impre unprecedented heat wave will spur her and her government to implement more measures to cut carbon emissions and then tackle climate change. 
Claire, thank you so much for coming on and joining us all the way from Sardinia. We will speak to you again very soon and stay hydrated. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks and thanks for having me. Our journalists are covering every level of the climate crisis, cutting through complex scientific information to bring you clarity. To support this important work and keep up to date with all of the latest news and features, consider a subscription. Go to inews.co.uk forward slash podcast and get more than 30% off a digital subscription to I. I for Open Minds. Subscribe today. We're joined now by our environment correspondent, Daniel Capuro, and our science and environment correspondent, Tom Borden, to get into what all of this means for the climate. This heatwave obviously wreaking sort of havoc across the Med. And I think the first thing to ask is why is this heatwave happening? So explaining individual weather patterns and and attributing sort of cause can sometimes be quite complicated and involves crazy calculations and big computers. But generally speaking, in sort of very loose terms, you have a high pressure system, lots of hot air coming north from the Sahara, from Africa, over to continental Europe, which is bringing with it clear blue skies, very high temperatures. But you've then got a few other factors that are coming into it as well. So you have the jet stream, which is this band of uh, very fast high altitude air about five to six miles above our heads in the atmosphere, spinning around the globe. And that tends to act as a barrier between high pressure and low pressure systems. So at the moment, it's helping to trap the high pressure system over the continent. It's also the reason that the UK, bits of Scandinavia and places aren't experiencing these extreme temperatures because it's uh, holding the high pressure system to the south of us and uh, keeping us kind of mild and unsettled. Beyond that, you've got these sort of very worrying increases in ocean temperatures, which we've been hearing about in recent weeks. The exact reasons behind that are not totally understood, not well understood. But it means that the ocean and the seas, the Mediterranean in this case, have gone from sort of moderating factors that keep temperatures low in coastal areas to having less of that effect, which again means much more elevated temperatures. And then our listeners might have heard about something called a heat dome, which you're starting to see in parts of of Europe. It's become more common in the United States, where we're also seeing very extreme high temperatures. But this is almost a sort of self-perpetuating effect of the high pressure system where cold air sort of comes down, pins the hot air low to the ground, hot air rises up the sides of the dome. So it's almost sort of a a flipped upside down dome and generates the whole system again where cold air gets sucked down and heated up. And so you basically end up with sort of a low band of very, very hot air close to the ground. Tom, how much of this is being influenced by the climate crisis? It's very likely that it's playing quite a significant role. I mean, obviously, there's all sorts of factors involved, as Dan's just explained. But there's been an underlying increase in temperatures since the Industrial Revolution and since, you know, we started putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere of sort of 1.2, 1.3 degrees. And it varies a bit across the world. So it's not always as straightforward as saying it's adding that, that amount to any given temperature. But what it is definitely doing is increasing the likelihood of these kind of heat waves and these kind of maximum temperatures. So while they probably won't be able to say categorically that it was the result of climate change, or certainly not not for some time, it would seem to be playing a reasonable role in the situation. Dan, in what way is the climate crisis having this effect? We talk a lot about how much a warming climate impacts these kind of weather events, but actually, how does that work? You know, as I was saying before, the climate is incredibly unpredictable. That's why the weather forecasts are only ever a few days ahead, because climate is, is sort of something very different. And it's, and it's hard to grasp because there's so many different factors going on. What we're seeing at the moment is maybe what people might traditionally have expected from climate change. You know, when they were learning at school 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that climate change is going to happen. Is we're all going to get hot. It's going to be very unpleasant. But of course, actually, climate change, what it really causes is unpredictability and it causes extremes. Everything is going out of kilter. So... An example of how that works is as you have higher global temperatures, as you have higher marine temperatures, you get more evaporation from the oceans. So you have more water stored in the clouds, which means bigger rainstorms. It means bigger monsoons, stronger hurricanes. You're basically putting more energy into the system. So if you think of it as, you know, maybe a scale electrics track, right, and you're holding down the trigger and it's going faster and faster and faster, the more energy there is in there, the more likelihood there is for chaos, for things to not go the way they were meant to, to not be predictable. 
So what we're seeing now is kind of the effects of that, that you have heat wave events. So for example, last year's heat wave in the UK, the one where we had record temperatures, we hit 40 degrees. That was a one in 500 year event. And yet we've come close to that multiple times and it seems more likely that it will happen again. So I think the, the Met Office reckons that there is now twice as much of a chance of record setting months like we've just had with June as there was in, in 1940, which was the previous hottest June. So everything's kind of becoming less predictable and, and more chaotic. And a good example of that is this jet stream that, that I mentioned earlier. So the jet stream is driven by the fact that you have a temperature differential between the moderate temperate air around the northern hemisphere, around places like Britain, that kind of latitude, and the cold Arctic air above, you know, above the Arctic Ocean. Now, the Arctic is one of the places that's warming fastest on the planet is getting warmer faster than most other places on Earth. And that's reducing the temperature differential between the Arctic and below the jet stream. And it's that temperature differential that gives the jet stream its energy, that gives it its speed. So by reducing that differential, you're slowing down the jet stream. And because it's slower, it's less rigid, it's less powerful, it starts to wiggle, it starts to move around. Now in the summer, that can mean that it ends up with sort of kinks in it and it's stuck further north, for example. So Britain gets stuck with high pressure, very hot weather, but it can also in winter mean the opposite. So when we get very, very cold winters, listeners might have seen in North America, when you had the polar vortex and ideas like this, that's linked to the jet stream where it's come further south and that's allowed freezing cold Arctic air to spill south and come to areas and bring snow and, and Arctic temperatures to places that weren't there before. So that's just one example really of how the global climate system is starting to break down and, and cease to function in the way that we're used to. And you mentioned that it's going to become more extreme, more unpredictable. That makes it much harder to prepare, doesn't it? If we can't kind of map and, and understand typical weather patterns, presumably we're far more likely to be caught off guard and therefore kind of suffer at the hands of these weather events. Absolutely. And, and as a country, you know, we've been accustomed over hundreds of years to fairly mild and moderate climate. Just yesterday, actually, the Environment Department, DEFRA, published its adaptation plan for the next five years, which is all about how the UK can prepare for extreme events, because there have been multiple warnings this year that the UK is not, not ready. And some of that's very sort of boring government stuff about linking up local government, linking up communications, spending and things. But a lot of it, you know, there's also things like health warning systems. You know, they sometimes get mocked uh, in sections of the media for telling people obvious things like don't go out in the midday sun. But you do need these health warning systems because people just they don't understand how dangerous 40 plus degrees can be. But adaptation runs into any number of things, you know, particularly with extreme temperature, we, we're going to have to change how our houses work. We're meant to be working really hard in better insulating our homes to deal with the cold. And to an extent that helps with the, with the heat as well. But there are specific adaptations that homes ne will need to make them better adapted to heat. And we basically don't have the housing stock for that. We have very old, decrepit homes that are too cold in winter and will soon be too hot in summer. As you've established, Dan, here in the UK, we're not really feeling this heat wave. In fact, looking out of the eye office, it is pretty grey at the moment. But it's not just the Med, is it, Tom, which is being affected by this? I think it's the US and China are having a particularly tough time with temperatures at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think last week actually was the hottest week that has been recorded globally, uh, the highest temperature ever recorded globally. This week is heading to be the hottest week ever in Europe. Wow. And also, yeah, China has, I think, yesterday had its hottest temperature on record as well. So it's definitely not just a European thing, you know, and, and it, as Dan mentioned earlier, the Arctic is warming faster than, than anywhere else in the world. So although we haven't been hearing much about that this week, it's, uh, it won't be that much longer probably before they hit the news for, for high temperatures as well. And should we be bracing for something like this in the UK? I mean, as you say, unpredictability is, is the name of the game. But certainly last summer, you know, we really were hit by that drought where all the parks turned brown. Um, are we expecting things like that later on in the year for us? Uh, well, certainly the Met Office thinks that there's an elevated probability of above average temperatures, which, so, which in normal terms yeah. means, yeah, there's a chance that it's going to be hotter. And we have just come off the hottest June, as I said earlier, the hottest June on record. It hasn't been quite as bad as, as last year's record temperatures, but but there's always a chance of it. And, you know, as we've seen kind of things breaking down and becoming less predictable, there's every chance that we could have significantly hot temperatures. A repeat of last year maybe is unlikely. 
And the Met Office still thinks that a normal summer is more likely than not. But yes, there's certainly a chance. Tom, what about the kind of longer term picture on this? So there was a particularly concerning report that came out last week, which found that of all the countries in the world, the UK and also Switzerland, will see the highest increase in what they call uncomfortably hot days in the whole world. In percentage terms, there's going to be a a 30% increase in sort of, it's a bit of a loose definition, but but they basically sort of say that it's 25 degrees is, is considered to be uncomfortably hot. So it's predicted to be a 30% increase in those. Yeah, and just to come in on what Tom was saying and and when we're talking about the bigger picture of climate change, there's also two distinct elements to think about. One is the fact that climate change makes things that would have happened anyway worse. And the other is it can make things happen that previously would have been impossible. And I think most climate scientists agree that last year's heat wave, where the UK hit 40 degrees, is the latter category. This country just was not capable of hitting 40 degrees, even maybe a decade ago, two decades ago. And you can very much say that was only possible because of climate change, because we've gone past one degree of warming. Separately from that, you have heat waves that would have happened anyway, storms that would have happened anyway, floods, things like that, that would just get worse. You know, higher temperatures, more flooding, more rainfall. But you are seeing a shift in basically in local and regional climates, right? People will think about Andalusia and Extremadura and places like that where, you know, 40 degrees happened. For them, what's possible is now pushing higher. You know, it might be that by mid-century, Spain is occasionally getting more than 50 degrees of heat Celsius, which at the moment you only really see in Death Valley in, in California. And then, you know, some of the places that haven't necessarily hit the headlines during this heat wave, you know, Baghdad in Iraq is sort of suffering 48, 49 degrees. And for them, it's the case that those extreme temperatures that they might have seen every decade or so, maybe even less often than that, are now happening every year, which makes it a very dangerous and difficult place to live. Well, those temperatures are deadly, aren't they, once we reach that point? Yeah, exactly. Basically, once you reach a point where the human body is no longer able to cool itself down, you are risking death. The exact temperature varies from place to place. And the key issue is humidity. So you'll hear scientists talk about a wet bulb temperature. I'm sure listeners will be very familiar with this, especially living in the UK. It can be 25 degrees, but uncomfortably hot because the humidity is the humidity level is at 60, 70, 80 or even above. You know, you might notice it before a a big storm cloud comes overhead. Um, It's so humid that the air around you can't take on the moisture that is on your skin. It's not evaporating and therefore you don't get the energy loss, which is how your body cools. Your body cools by the water evaporating, it takes energy with it and you're cooler, which is why, you know, 35 degrees at 10% humidity might not be that unpleasant. And that's partly why that central equatorial band around the planet is going to become one of the most difficult places to live is not necessarily that those areas will hit 50 plus degrees like you'd see in, in Iraq or Saudi Arabia, but that those places are hot and humid. And so for those places to become dangerous, even for a few weeks of the year, might only require temperatures in the very high 30s, low 40s for it to become dangerous to be outside without air conditioning. We've laid out a pretty dire picture, I think, of the current state of affairs. And I'm interested in what's being done to try and tackle this. To what extent are weather events like this pushing forward the need for activity on the climate? And to what extent is that being answered? It's definitely becoming increasingly evident every day, and it has been for the last few years, really, that we are in the midst of climate change rather than it sort of being something further down the road. And it's it's only going to get a lot worse. It is, the problem is you need long term investment and a long term plan that won't yield sort of results for a while and could potentially be costly in the short term, even though it would create jobs and all that kind of stuff. But it, it, the way that politics is set up means that, that governments are reluctant to take these kind of short term decisions because they're just much more concerned about getting elected. Having said that, I mean, there's increasing pressure from all sorts of people all, all around the world. And there's increasing evidence that climate change is, is causing all sorts of problems. So hopefully, we will be moving in the right direction. But we have all these things like we have the 1.5 degree 
Celsius kind of in Paris, you know, the famous target of 1.5 degrees. We're going to, the whole world is pulling together and making this landmark announcement. But actually, it looks like we're going to go past, that was only a few years ago, and now it looks like we're going to go past 1.5 degrees in the next few years. So that's not really happened. And then in Glasgow, we were, were hosting a COP and there was, you know, a, a global meeting. And again, there was lots of excitement and talk about breakthroughs and, you know, that kind of thing. And yet a series of reports about the government still not really doing what's necessary and not really appreciating the problem and just re-announcing old policies that they'd already said and so on. And I mean, there's definitely a lot more focus on it and attention being given to it than there has been in, in the last few years, but the clock is really ticking now. So it's, you know, at the very least, it's going to cause huge problems in the coming years. So certainly a lot left to be done. Dan, in terms of how we actually learn to live with this obviously everybody's priority is to prevent this heating in the first place but clearly as we've outlined it's not possible at the moment for us to just hit the stop button this is happening as tom said to what extent can we adapt to this as well as just try and sort of mitigate the impact yeah there's a there's a really important question and uh, it's one that for a few years climate activists were reluctant to engage with because they didn't want to talk about adaptation because they didn't want to create a get out. They Mm. didn't want to imply that it was okay to let climate change happen. And so to some extent, there's not been enough movement on this anyway. The important thing about that 1.5 warning is the World Meteorological Organization has said we'll probably breach it over the next five years. They have said it's possible to pull back from that. We'll have to use sort of technology to get carbon out of the air. So it might be that we pass 1.5 for a few years, come back from it. What we're seeing now is the warming at 1.2. And the warming of the oceans is locked in. You know, they take centuries to warm up, centuries to cool down. The loss of ice is locked in. So so you're absolutely right. This stuff is happening. We have to deal with it. Even if we switched all carbon emissions off tomorrow, we're going to have to deal with this stuff. But it's incredibly politically difficult and contentious. So, you know, listeners may have heard the term loss and damage. And that's really at the center of all of the COP negotiations, which is that the poorest countries in the world are the ones that are suffering the most because they're in the areas we were discussing earlier that are most impacted by rising temperatures. They're the ones who've done the least to cause climate change and they're the ones with the least amount of money to to adapt to it. So that's a huge part of this diplomacy, but it's incredibly difficult because there's lots of countries, you know, China, for example, doesn't want to be considered a rich country yet because it argues it still has hundreds of millions of poor people and they don't want to necessarily chip into the fund for developing countries. Um, so there's lots of sort of contentious rows about how it will work. There's been some progress, but it's still kind of the big issue of, of how do we help poorer countries. But, you know, in terms of a country like the UK, we're, we're relatively wealthy. We should be able to put in place these adaptations. The government doesn't want to be too interventionist. So it's a lot of the time it's a case of putting in place, you know, regulations that make the private sector do it, whether it's forcing landlords to up- upgrade flats or new build homes or whatever it is. But but there's lots of little things you can do. So, for example, we need more urban trees. You know, London, where we're talking now, isn't too bad. It does have a lot of urban trees. But when it comes to really, really hot temperatures, you know, trees are great because they, just like the human body when it sweats, the trees help to cool down the local areas with evapotranspiration. But you need places where people can go and cool down. And on really hot days, that might actually have to be places like churches being heat shelters, air-conditioned school halls and gyms that can be opened up to the public, to people who live in uncomfortably hot, sweaty homes. There might have to be cultural changes. You know, when we work, you know, do we have to do sort of a Spanish thing of working earlier in the day and later at night and then being at home cowering from the heat during the middle of the day? You know, whole new approaches to things. But but it really does, as with so many elements of climate change, it really does get at all of the cracks in the edifice of public life. Because, you know, for example, hospitals. Hospitals are really at risk of overheating. Dozens of them, you know, there's special reports looking at this. And it's because our hospitals are old and crumbling and underfunded. So this is climate change is one of those things that will make every single challenge that you already have in running a country more difficult. Yeah. I cover refugees and migration as a big part of what I do, and that's massively going to be affected by the climate. You know, you're going to have more and more people living in places which are unlivable and they are going to have to leave. It's going to force global movement of people across borders as well as the massive changes within borders. Absolutely. And again, that will be, as we saw with Syria in 2015, that's potentially very destabilising for politics and you potentially then have people who come along and don't want to do anything about climate change. And, And, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort, but it's going to take us all being a bit mature and grown up about this and thinking about the problems hard 
and realising that, you know, some of us will have to make some sacrifices. Well, let's certainly hope that we can do that. Thank you both so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you, even if this topic is ever so slightly daunting. You can follow Dan and Tom's reporting at inews.co.uk. I'm Molly Blackall. You can follow me on Instagram at molly.blackall and on Twitter at Molly Blackall. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next week.